Uh, then we have uh, our colleagues Ika and Ula as a program officers at Salma program, uh, which is a very, very important integration element for the Finnish Refugee Council. And of course, needless to say that Finnish Refugee Council and, and, and council activities are going well beyond just integration, of course. But of course, this time we will focus uh, on integration. So uh, I will not talk more. I think you will, you will do this better because you have much better experiences. So Johanna, uh, Ula, Ika, over to you. Thank you, Carolis. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Now I'm just putting the slideshow on. So you will see it, it see it even better. Nice to be here and, and join your, your uh, discussions today. My name is Johanna Varjan and I, as mentioned, I work for IKEA uh, Finland uh, uh, in the equality, diversity and inclusion area where we work with our recruitment and talent sourcing and, and so on to represent uh, our uh, colleagues, uh, our uh, co-workers as, as diverse uh, as possi possible it is. And we have done this cooperation with our uh, Finnish Refugee Council. And, and with me, I have uh, uh, two close colleagues uh, who, who can present themselves. Thank you, Johanna. Uh, my name is Ulla Tarkka, and I work in uh, Finnish Refugee Council, as mentioned. And uh, I am, my background is in teaching. I am a teacher. And I, I work as a program officer in Sauma Career Training Project. And hello, everyone. I'm, I'm Iikka Tuominen, and I'm, I'm also working in Finnish Refugee Council. Uh, me and Ulla, we are running the Sauma Career Training Project, which is one of the Finnish Refugee Council's projects in, in Finland. Yes. So uh, me working uh, for IKEA, uh, I, I'm here to tell uh, some, uh, some about our vision as well. So in IKEA, our vision is to create the better everyday life for the many people. And this goes into many levels for our co-workers, for our customers, for our future customers, for our workers in our supply chains and also our local communities. Uh, really much about the social impact for the better everyday life that we have. We have many people and planet positive programs running around. And as Karolis mentioned, this uh, uh, Skills for Employment for Refugees program is running globally. We have uh, uh, a goal for 2,500 participants for this. And in, in Finland, our share is 70 persons. Uh, through through cooperation with Finnish Refugee Council and Ulan and, and Ika. Okay, so I will tell a little bit about uh, Finnish Refugee Council, what we do. So it's a an organize uh, an expert organization on refugee issues and integration, already founded in 1965. And uh, nowadays we work both abroad uh, and in Finland. And in Finland, uh, we are supporting individuals and communities in uh, integration. And uh, the main goal is to support fulfillment of rights uh, of migrants and refugees and equal participation in society. And the uh, project me and Ika are working specifically for is called Sauma career training, and the project helps refugees and migrants in finding employment and then adapting to work life in Finland. And um, it's very important to, to work for employment specifically, because it is, uh, it is known that employment is a key factor for integration. And uh, it is like then two-way integration, both the society will learn to know the newcomers and the newcomers will learn to know the society. So it's, it's very important, both socially and economically. And it is also known that refugees are in specifically, specifically vulnerable position 
in the labor market. There are, of course, studies about the figures and, and uh, the unemployment is, is much higher in Finland in the group of, uh, of uh, non-Finnish speakers and especially refugees. And of course, the coronavirus has made it even, even worse because then the ones who are in vulnerable pos posi uh, position in labor market are even more vulnerable than before. So we in Sauma Career Training are trying to make this work better. And that's why we are organizing courses for job seekers. And one course uh, takes about one month. And during that, uh, we are um, uh, helping to find jobs in a group. And we have mentoring and coaching and individual support there as uh, helping methods for finding job. And then uh, for those who, who find a job then uh, of our participants, we also offer a six months support period uh, because often there are some challenges in the in starting working life, especially if it's the first first job in the new society for a refugee. And then uh, we also support employers in recruitment uh, in those companies who are willing to see diversity uh, in their company. So uh, the goals are sustainable employment for for uh, migrants and refugees. And then, of course, diverse work communities that will make the whole society uh, welcome the people better and understand, create understanding in the society. And uh, so cooperation with IKEA has been great for working towards this goal. And uh, now we will tell a little bit more about the cooperation. Yes. Uh, we at IKEA are working for our uh, vision and, and goal for creating better everyday life, but we need also partners for this. And that's why we are relying on the Finnish Refugee Council's experience. Uh, they have the connections, they know how to support the best, and they have provided us also support for our body systems that are supporting the onboarding of the new co-worker, how to use clear finish and, and so on with our, uh, with our uh, onboarding processes. And this has been really fruitful, this uh, cooperation together. And, and on the following slides, we are going more into the deeps of, of uh, our cooperation, but the best thing with, with working with the Finnish Refugee Council has been that they really know our target audience. Okay, I can continue from our point of view. Uh, uh, we, uh, as an NGO and one of the project of a relatively big NGO, we would do this kind of project anyway, where we aim to uh, help refugees to people with refugee background to get a job but having a global well-known almost giant uh, employer involved in this project it just makes also our project so much better meaning more employments which is like that's what we do we try to help people to get a job and these corporations like dramatically increase that rate and also uh, more visibility uh, after this cooperation, social media and, and like many other platforms has been talking about this pretty much actually, this, this uh, cooperation and, and more interested people also. So I think in general, and also uh, if I, Got it right, Carolis. You mentioned this on the in introduction that companies actually have, uh, like, they have a big role as a societal influencer or like integration actors. NGOs do this anyway, but it's not enough. It's not enough uh, because, uh, well, we we did get results even before this cooperation, but still now, now it's better. 
And uh, what NGOs can do, uh, like Johanna said, we, uh, we can offer the expertise because companies are not, that's not what they, they are focused on mainly because that companies do what companies do. So NGOs can offer the expertise and it, in this case is uh, refugees and integration issues. So uh, we know the target group, we, we, can, we can open a door how to reach the target group and we can advise how to do things uh, in a way that it could work with this target group and also in a respectful way. And, and of course, for an individual, uh, uh, for example, for someone who has uh, on an integration process to a Finnish society, like getting a job and earning money is, is one of the key factors. It's, it's essential. Yeah, the diversity within the, the work group is, is also really important or in the working community, we get a better business results when we have more diverse co-workers also understanding our customers need. And that is one, one great point with our cooperation as well. Yeah. And how do we work together? We have this three years program that we are aiming to, to employ 70 uh, refugees. Uh, we started uh, at the uh, January 2021. We have had few uh, groups already joining already for our program. And uh, some of them have also continued working, working for, for IKEA after this program, which has been really the, the winning for us. Uh, our cooperation was also uh, uh, as one of the finalists for the most responsible uh, recruitment act in Finland. And this was really a great example with, with uh, programs that had really social impact that were risen on this, this gala and, and competition. And, and we were really proud to be representing us in the, in the final together. So uh, Ulla and Ika can go more into detail. How do we uh, connect uh, with the participants? Uh, yeah. First, first, a few words about like what is needed to make this cooperation work. And please, Ulla, remind me if I forgot to answer jo Johanna's <laughs> question. Uh, so like Johanna mentioned, uh, this uh, cooperation project has been uh, running since 2021, the whole this year. However, the first uh, meeting with IKEA was already on December uh, 2000, 2019. And the whole year of 2020 was more or less planning and preparation. And, and why I'm bringing this up is that we've been asked quite often, like other NGOs or actors in Finland has asked, like how, how this is organized, the whole thing. So, so the whole year 2020 was uh, like preparing, of course, the COVID virus came and did some changes to the schedules. We would have maybe uh, begun a little bit earlier. But however, we, we needed to know each other's like working practices because we represent, represent like two different worlds, uh, business world and NGO world. And then, then again, both have the same uh, IKEA want to do uh, societal work as well or pro projects and, and we are doing what we are doing. So we kind of had to combine these two, two uh, environments together and learn the you know, way of working and the practices and even like the language. And of course we needed to agree what we are doing and why Johanna mentioned that uh, the goals to uh, employ 70 refugees, well, IKEA's goal is uh, to employ 70 refugees during uh, three, three years, but also we agreed like how many uh, employees IKEA is looking for from each five-week training we are organizing with Ulla. 
and and we also uh, needed to create a criteria of what kind of candidates we are looking for people for example need to have a realistic possibility to move from their home to either of the ikea stores in the capital area of helsinki and so on and of course the certain language level to uh, to be able to participate and also uh, since everything has been online we had uh, created uh, some kind of structure to share information uh, safely between us and IKEA about our participants and in, in general I think we kind of had created uh, like shared understanding how how we do things and why and what we are doing and all this needs a lot of time so time is one resource that has been needed it's in it's mark on our calendar like not not weekly but monthly basis and and also trust so that we know we are on the same same like what's the word same side and we are doing the same thing same page yes same page yeah thank you and and that of course needs a lot of communication and now i forgot what was what was i supposed to explain yeah it was something more about like how do we reach the people for for this program and and you are working with the with the course helping them for, yeah. for writing their work applications and so on because that is one part of this program as well how to apply for the Finnish companies what is needed how to recognize your skills how to put it on the paper as well that is also tricky and hard when you might not have the relevant certifications or or uh, same kind of vocational background and how to recognize the same level education also sometimes for for kind of meeting the the require requirements that we have but for example ikea finland's two uh, working languages they are finnish and english that have helped our co-workers to be more diverse because you will get every information either on on these both both languages you need to just uh be uh fluent or or skilled enough to speak one on one or the another and uh, that is one kind of key point how to provide information for our co-workers how to make it easier how to support their their onboarding with our body programs uh and then uh, Ulla and Ika have really talented volunteer mentors who are uh, helping the, the participants with their CVs and, and applications and, and so on, and, and also supporting them with, uh, with uh, applying for their next position also in the future. And, and uh, this is really important that you have some, someone supporting you to, to move forward and finding your place as the work is really important to, to recognizing your, your individuality with your community and, and see, well, sensing the inclusion at the workplace. Yeah. And I think one, one, one of the key things here is uh, your question, how do we reach the people? Because uh, like, uh, since this is a refugee initiative, people are refugee, with refugee background, and then uh, all our participants are also interested in working in IKEA or such other uh, similar uh, jobs. And also, like I mentioned, uh, to be able to move to IKEA store uh, five days a week and, and have the language level. So already the basic knowledge of Finnish. So that's pretty much things that has to be in one person to be able to part participate on this project. And that's what me and Ulla uh, are doing. We, we reach those people. And when we began uh, early 2019, this project, IKEA cooperation didn't exist at that time then and and i know this this is also the case of other ngos who are doing about the similar jobs in in helsinki area uh, it's not easy to reach reach the, the target group uh, 
uh, and it took time and we we have been changing the way uh, before uh, covid uh, virus we uh, we were on uh, we participated on events pretty much to talk about people and we uh, we we went to the places uh, to present ourselves where where those people uh, we, well we knew that the people were and uh, then we started to uh, advertise on uh, Facebook uh, and we have a communication unit in in uh, in Finnish Refugee Council who helps us for doing that and that helped us a lot to uh, get interested people so uh, now we are having about 100 interested people who would like to participate on one training and we only can take about 20 people on one training five-week training so uh, from that that amount of people we are kind of interviewing and trying to sort out uh, those who would fit the best and who would uh, get the best out of this five-week training and then possibility to work in IKEA. I guess we are running out of time, but yeah, I me can, too. I'm sorry. <laughs> I can I can add to what Ika, Ika said that exactly that is. Um, interesting part of our job when we have 100 applicants and we can take 20 who we can help to find job. So we are balancing between that, that who needs our help and then who is uh, like kind of already uh, integrated enough to, to be able to do the work search process in Finnish language because those who have just arrived to Finland, we, we cannot help them because their language level is not suitable yet to find yeah. employment. Five weeks is not enough for, for everyone. I, I guess we have to wrap up unless... Yeah, yeah, yes. thank you. Ula. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much, Johanna, Ikan, Ula. Uh... Yes, uh, we have some questions, so I think I will give the priority now to our participants. And I'm now going to a, a, a slide. And one of the questions, which has been repeated twice, it's about the outcomes that you have quite a lot of refugees, which are engaged in the training after the selection. And then you have a bit less uh, of those who work. And then we have only four, which are uh, still working after three months. So uh, Maria and Rugile, they are asking, what are the challenges and what are the reasons behind that after the training of 64 refugees, you have four refugees which are employed? And maybe it would be good maybe for you just to emphasize the difference between the training and employment and et cetera. So over to you. If, if I may uh, answer this, uh, then, then uh, Johanna and Ika can can continue. But uh, I think the the bigger <laughs> biggest challenge in these numbers at the moment is that the recruitment processes are still ongoing. So that's also why we marked those numbers with yellow, because only half of those 63 or was it 64 people have already gone through the whole process. So actually half of them are still uh, under the recruitment process and we don't have the uh, numbers ready. Uh, we don't know yet who of them will be employed and who not. And uh, and IKEA uh, IKEA's plan has been to like also um, make the number of employed people bigger. As we only started in the beginning of this year, so first uh, first IKEA took. Uh, five people from the first course, then six people from the, from the second course. And the aim is to get the numbers higher by the end of the year. Also then the number of those who continued their job uh, at IKEA after this three months period, which is uh, part of our project, that is low because many of them haven't completed that uh, three months work period yet so we don't actually know yet if they will continue or not so I assume that uh, by March or April next year those numbers that were now marked with yellow they they will rise a lot 
and that's only IKEA numbers, then those from our course who are not employed by IKEA, many of them actually find uh, some other job, which can be some of their specific interest. For example, in our course, there are many people uh, who are who have studied to work in logistics or uh, construction or um, business, and and they often find uh, jobs that are also uh, suitable for their specific knowledge in some other companies. Because we don't only concentrate on IKEA, but of course everyone will uh, apply for other jobs also that are interesting for them. Thank you very much. This is what I also wanted to emphasize that uh, the regular this in, the IK employment initiative, it, it has very interesting specific feature that even though it is a cooperation, let's say, between Finnish Refugee Council and Finland, IK of Finland, uh, basically we are preparing the refugees, you know, to be employed beyond the beyond uh, IKEA stores, which is uh, which is really, really great. And that's what we see also with IKEA Norway. Uh, the other question. Uh, could you please describe the recruitment process very, very briefly? That's coming from Catherine Charles. Okay. Johanna, do you want to ask for this? Yeah. Uh, Ulla and Ik are, are connected with the, with the participants and with the support of their mentors. Uh, they write their applications that are sent out to our recruitment channel for, for the hiring managers that we have. We have agreed that every person that sends their application will get a interview, even though they weren't be kind of the ones that we choose. But that is also part of the uh, practice and, and job seeking part that, that you learn more by doing more. And uh, then the hiring decision is done in our units uh, who we are, are taking from this, this group for for our three months uh, temporary period that we are offering a employment for three months. After that, you have the possibility to continue if there are uh, suitable roles or you still enjoy that work. This is also a great way to be uh, testing uh, if, if the IKEA is, is your company and, and if the work is suitable for you and your skills and your needs. And me and Ulla's role here is to coach, to train and prepare the people to be ready to work in IKEA. Thanks a lot. Other places. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, we are running out of time, but we still have two questions and I think we still need to, to answer those questions. The first comes, uh, yeah, the first is on the language, which is really, really important. Uh, um, how do you address the language challenge? Are you including, let's say, uh, either illiterate people or people with a really limited language uh, knowledge? And if yes, you know, do you have any measures at the workplace how you're improving these, these skills? Um, uh, so I think this is really important for the Baltic context, context because the language policies in the Baltic states, they are really, really strict and there's uh, really high uh, requirements for people to enter the labor market. Um, we, we have both with Ulla, uh, worked as a teachers in uh, integration uh, education also so we uh, know pretty well the different language level and on from that base we have uh, uh, estimated what would be uh, the required approximately language level to be able to uh, get the benefits out of five weeks training which is focused on finding a job so that's kind of the frame in which we are working on. We don't set up a certain level that this level is required, but we interview a lot of people. And when, then we see who of the candidates would get the best out of this five week uh, uh, period. That, that's what our project is for. Mm. Okay. And then there are other services for other people. Mm. In other words, for those people who don't have uh, the suitable language levels yet, they have to attend language courses, they have to learn uh, basic Finnish first. Unfortunately, we cannot help everyone because this is not a language course and nobody learns a new language in five weeks. 
So, so mm. we have to find those participants who can already join the labor wow. market with a little help of our course. Thank you very much. And, and as an employer, our requirements for the language skills are based on the safety of the co-worker. They need to learn and understand the, the safety regulations that we have are part of our mandatory trainings. It's either in Finnish or in English, and those are our requirements. As an employer, we also offer a language course uh, support. And from the beginning of the next year, we have also language courses through Rosetta Stone uh, coming up for our uh, uh, competence development. Thank you very much. The last question maybe to Johanna Ronalds from uh, Employment Agency in Latvia is asking, what are the positions that uh, refugees are taking in a care stores? Uh, so that's maybe very briefly. And just to let you know, Rugila, that uh, Ronalds as an employment agency representative is collaborating with the IKEA Latvia. So maybe this is something to have a look for all of us in Lithuania as well. Johanna, what to you? Yeah, they have been in, in different parts of the IKEA departments. Some have worked for IKEA food in the, the dishwashing or, or the customer service. Some of them have been our customer service workers or customer relations workings, working uh, with our uh, chains. Uh, uh, what's it called? Mm, the same chain, well, chains desk, uh, could you say? or cashiers and also in logistics. And we are trying to fight also for our salespersons uh, and new co-workers through this. And uh, as uh, Ulani mentioned, some of the participants have really good background in, in constructions and so on. And we have taken carpenters also from this, this program. Thank you very much, Johanna and Ika and uh, uh, yeah. Uh, can I just now move straight forward to Dan, because we still, uh, I think we're running out of time. Dan, uh, over to you. Uh, Dan is a manager of social enterprise Kerman. Uh, I think we will get now totally different perspective, but which is, I think, equally also important for, for the Baltic context. Dan, uh, the, the screen is yours. Yep, sure. Uh, hey, everybody. So I will... Uh talk a little bit about the Estonian uh, local perspective. So yeah, it's uh, maybe a little bit smaller scale. Uh, so let me see if I can manage uh, basic Zoom skills. Uh, so do you guys see the screen? Yes, we see it. Yeah, yeah, we see. Uh, so yeah, play from start maybe. Yay, okay, it works. Great, yep, so uh, we are Kerman. So basically we are a small uh, social enterprise uh, located in Tartu, Estonia. And uh, let's see, yay, it works. So basically where the our idea came from was from this place. So I was in uh, Palestine, as you can see by the little flag. I was living, living in this uh, white house. And while I was there for a while, I really found out that the people there were super, super generous. The food was super, super good. And then, you know, it was all good. I went back to Estonia. And when I reached Estonia, I started working as a refugee support person. And I saw, you know, I met the same people from Middle Eastern countries. And I, you know, tried to help them. And I really remember one time when uh, I met with a family who, has, who had been unemployed for, I don't know, four or five years and I sat down with them and you know it was the same experience as I had in Palestine you know so the same delicious food everything like this and then there was like a crash in my brain that okay I have been trying to find good food in Estonia I haven't been really able to there is a person or family sitting next to me who knows how to make the food and has the skills and they have been unemployed for four or five years like what is happening here so that was kind of the beginning of our business. Uh, so we you know we sat down with the, with the refugee family. We invited a couple of more people there, and then we started this uh, social enterprise. So basically, right now, what we do, we are a food company. Uh, so we do catering. We do different food workshops. We have like some takeaway cafe. So basically, the essence is that we take refugees and migrants 
who have settled in uh, Tartu in Estonia, in Tallinn as well. And we then try to give them the first employment opportunity. And at the same time also, you know, try to, uh, at one point, you know, try to give this on the business side, you know, give like good new food experiences and cuisine to the local people. So that's how we earn money. But again, our main aim is refugee integration. So we do, you know, we try to engage people to get their first experience. So the impact model that we use are that we have a refugee who uh, contacts us or we find them and they, come to German and they will be in our this kind of a development program for three to six months and in the program we have three main goals one is just giving their first employment opportunity so they know you know they know the culture they they have something to show on the cv afterwards uh, that somebody some company has trusted them in Estonia and number two they are actually working so that means, you know, we have some uh, courses, some mentors, different kind of measures that they get acquainted with the local job culture. How is it, how to do it, so forth. And number three, we have on the job Estonian language courses and, you know, as courses, but also as supporting, you know, mentors in everyday work life. Uh, so in the end, if they have been at German in this program, let's say, for three to six months. In the end of it, uh, they have something to show on the CV. They have uh, Estonian language experience, you know, practical language experience that they can handle themselves at the job. Uh, and also they understand the local work culture. How, how is it here? How to do it? How to mm, handle coworkers? You know, how, how to talk with bosses? What is the context here? So in the end, when they have finished this program, they have two options. If there is a fit, if we need, if they are interested, they can continue working at German, you know, as in a food industry. Or if uh, if not, they have a different goal, they have a different background, they can move forward, they can establish their own little cafe, or they can go on to pursue their, you know, original career as a doctor, as a whoever, manager. Because in any case, if you're a manager, you still need basic Estonian language, you still need to understand the work culture, and this can still be your first step uh, so we see our role as kind of a little bit, you know, if I connected with the previous uh, presentation, as a little bit of a pre-step that, you know, if, if a refugee is already speaks Estonian or English, then, you know, maybe he doesn't need to come to us. Uh, but if there is a refugees who are illiterate or don't speak any language, have less, less opportunities that they can't just go to a place or can't even go to a restaurant, even though they know cooking skills, they can come to us. We kind of prepare them. And then, then, you know, if you want, if there is a fit, they stay with us. Uh, and they, you know, they become kind of mentors for new refugees in our program, or we forward them to do other companies, uh, help them build their own enterprise, you know, whatever is the need there. So that's kind of how we work. Uh, and uh, this is a little bit big. Come on, go somewhere. Yes. So, uh, of course, partnership is really, really important uh, in terms of finding refugees and assistance. Uh, so, you know, partnership with NGOs. Uh, so that's how, and, you know, the whole point of my presentation is from the perspective is a, from a small company, a local small company in Estonia, in Latvia, and Lithuania. So, you know, I would say definitely to cooperate with local NGOs, like in Finland, the Finnish Refugee Council in other countries. So in that way, you can find the refugees. Where are they? What are the skills? What is the background? You don't have to work alone or figure out alone in the darkness. And also you could talk with the local NGOs to have some assistance with interpretation, with you know background knowledge, all these kind of things. And of course, as we do also here, we... Uh, are in close contact with the local unemployment office and we have been using their supportive measures. They have some uh, support for companies who hire refugees and which is also really beneficial, obviously. But yes, for us, the main thing is uh, the question, partners or beneficiaries? So, you know, for us, we don't look at refugees as beneficiaries. 
uh, as, as a traditional NGO. As we said, we are a social enterprise. So they are for us really like partners. And we have two key principles, which sound very right wing, but there is a meaning behind it. So number one, no refugees and no pity. So, you know, we don't even in our when you check out our Facebook page, we don't really say that, oh, we are a refugee cafe or anything like this, uh, you know, and also in our recruitment process, when a refugee comes to us, we, we don't take him or her as a refugee. We just we have a team of skilled and valuable members, you know, some are senior, some have experience, some don't. Uh, but we don't employ anybody who just because he or she is a refugee, you know, because everybody has a skill. And if you're a refugee, that means you came here. That means you are more willing to take risks. You're more having self-initiative, you know, so there is skills there to find that. And we also don't show no pity. Again, we don't employ because he's a refugee, you know, we just sit down with the people, we find a skill and, uh, and then they, they can use the skill with us. Uh, and this, I think, is a key why we work and why our system works, because we ha I have been also, you know, in different NGOs organizing trainings. And here, you know, you can always skip a training. But in German, in our company, no, you have the skills. You're not employed just because you're a refugee. You have a skill. You have a purpose. You come to work. If you don't come, the company suffers. Something is missing. You know, if you go just for a training, you don't come, then no, okay, you don't come. So, you know, this kind of gives this self sense of responsibility, sense of dignity to the person that actually they matter, you know, they're not just a token there. And also why our system kind of maybe has worked uh, is because there is this cooking part. We are a cooking company. So this is a very easy thing that, again, puts the refugees in the state of expertise. You know, we are not just teaching them what to do, but they're also teaching us. Like I'm not going to a catering and doing Syrian food. I don't know how to do that, but they do, you know? So this is a partnership. They are experts. Again, they are needed. They can get out of this, you know, sense of just being trained and just being told how to be integrated refugees, you know? So I think that's one of the key factors why, uh, why it really works for us uh, so far. And uh, challenges, I just thought to write down a little bit there. So there is a couple of them. Uh, so there's conflicts between ethnic groups or strong personalities. And just as a context, we are a small company, we are a social enterprise. So I, you know, 80% of our workers are refugees or migrants. So, you know, it's a little bit different than just if you're a company and you just employ one refugees. But again, conflict between, as you can say, ethnic groups is crossed out because it doesn't really happen that much. More or less, it's uh, about strong personalities. And again, when I started out with refugees, I was thinking that, oh, they have some strong personalities. What can we do here? But now we have employed also Estonians. And, you know, I don't see big of a difference. You know, so in terms of us having a refugee team, I don't see really that much of ethnic groups or this need of super cultural awareness on my part. It's just strong personalities as with Estonians, as with local people. So the solution is to just sit down with the people and ask like, okay, what's up? If, if it happens to come to this. Uh, and, you know, one of the challenge can be also cultural awareness. You know, how, how do, you know, I don't know, a person comes from Eritrea or Syria, like, okay, how, how should I deal with them? Can I, if she's a woman, can I, you know, shake her hand? Can I look in her eyes? Can I, whatever, all this kind of stuff. And again, you know, we have found out that it isn't really that much of an issue. And, you know, I have been living in different countries and I have been giving trainings on cultural awareness and these kind of stuff. And even I, like, I'm not an expert in any of these. And it's unrealistic <laughs> to be an expert at cultural awareness. Uh, best you can do is think that you're an expert, but really you're not. Uh, that's just how it is you know so most of the time the solution to cultural awareness is just asking if a refugee is from a different country you know he or she can understand that you don't know all the cultural differences so the best thing is just to ask you know what about you what is with you what do you feel comfortable with you know it doesn't make sense going to google and like i don't know googling syrian culture because syria is a huge country you know one city the culture is very different even when I am in Estonia, you know, the 
culture between Tallinn and Sarema, it's huge, you know, or a person who is working every day at the supermarket or a person who is working at an IT company, their everyday life is different. Same as here, you know, in Syria or in uh, other countries, you know. So it just makes sense to just ask and not really be bothered so much about, you know, stressing, oh, do I know enough about the culture? And of course, you know, another challenge is language. And we, we do employ or we do engage also people who don't speak any language. Uh, so the key here, what has worked for us is when, uh, as a first, you know, as a first refugee or a first uh, person, we try to employ somebody who speaks, you know, English or Estonian and that language, let's say English and Arabic or English and Tigrinya. So she or he can help then other people who come on board. So that's kind of a um, one way that we do. And again, you know, cooperation with NGOs. Huh? Maybe there is a volunteer uh, translators. Maybe there is some assistance there to try to help you out then. Uh, but for us, you know, the first person we employ her and she can, you know, kind of help this, uh, this way moving forward further. And again, lack of skills, you know, uh, or even when they have skills, even in restaurant business, you know, having a restaurant in Estonia and having a restaurant in uh, Syria is a very different thing, you know, just because you have five years experience there doesn't mean you can just open or operate it here. But again, this is just understanding what are the lack of skills and uh, putting up, you know, a system, how, how to teach them, how to learn together. But a lot of the time I have noticed that, you know, when, when I recruit a new person, if it's a refugee or if it's a local Estonian, in any case, they are lacking skills. <laughs> Even if the local Estonian has gone through cul culinary school, he or she is lacking skills. Eh? But at least in our perspective, some of the refugees, you know, a silver lining is that they can be much more motivated just for a sad fact that they have less options, you know, and when you are a company and you finally say in a good attitude, okay, come work with us, you know, let, let's try to do it together. And then a lot of the times I have found out that the motivation when I compare with some local employees uh, has been much higher because, you know, there is trust. Somebody finally, a company trusts me. And, you know, sometimes the motivation to learn new skills is uh, it's much quicker and be better. And some of the challenges is also, you know, when we are a restaurant and, you know, or for, I don't have time to talk about it, but for our, you know, uh, for learning skills and learning the language and the work culture, you know, they, they don't work in the kitchen alone. They interact with customers, they interact with people. So there are these bad Apple customers, basically racist, who I don't know, scream at uh, our refugees or, or say bad words, whatever, you know, that's definitely a challenge. But again, in our case, how I think about it is it happens in any case with the refugees. And it happens less at the workplace because still, you know, people, they're not that comfortable screaming at refugees when they're, you know, they have coworkers there. So these kind of things happen in any case. It happens more when the refugee is just walking on the street. So, you know, you don't have to, like I have had cases where person started, uh, I don't know, coming to our uh, counter in a restaurant and ask the refugee, okay, how many cockroaches did you put into the pie today? Yeah, you know, like, and then I felt, okay, shit, what can I do? How can I support the person? Can I, can I, can I all apply or can I employ refugees at all? Can, do I know how to handle this? But again, it happens with refugees all the time in workplace, less so. And only what we can do as employers is to give balance. You know, because these people come, they scream, they do stuff, but we can keep the balance and saying like, okay, it's okay. We still support you. We still love you, you know, and this kind of uh, works itself out. So you don't have to be really worried about this. And again, you know, bad Apple customers, it is bad Apple customers. It, it's not, it's not often, but when it does, you don't have to feel super stressed, you know, like it's your fault. No, it's not your fault, but you can do support and just say, you know, not everybody hates you. We don't hate you, you know? So that's kind of uh, how it is. Huh? And benefits for employers, for us and so forth, is at least in Estonia, there is a little, you know, a huge workforce crisis. It's hard to find employ employees, especially in the restaurant sector, but also in other sectors. 
and it is really an untouched segment, meaning that, you know, I'm thinking like, I hope other restaurants don't find out that there is so much skilled people <laughs> among refugees. <laughs> this is a party for us. Like everybody is like really hard finding new, I don't know, chefs and people. And I'm like, there's refugees. Nobody asked them. <laughs> and yes, they are there sitting, skilled, motivated. Okay. So untouched segment because, you know, they don't have that much opportunities. Everybody's afraid, so forth. So you can really find people there. Uh, otherwise you couldn't and you know i could also say loyalty because again for the same purpose that that they don't have that much of a opportunity from other employers and when you start working together with uh with with refugees with them they tend to be more loyalty you know that okay you trusted us and let's let's work together so it's more of a partnership, not just uh, it's another job. No, it's the, it's the first job. It's somebody who trusted them. And again, really, in a big way, new perspectives. Again, you know, when a refugee has been having a restaurant in Syria, yes, the skills are not the same as required for Estonia, but there is still skills. There is still perspectives that we can take over, that we can improve and really have an edge in our business. And in the same way, in a management process, or if I don't know, if a refugee has worked at uh, how, how do you say it? painting company, whatever I don't know the specific works. You know, maybe there is a def different technique that they use in Syria that they use in Eritrea. Maybe there is different management processes that I can learn from, uh, or or you know, in in the same way that some countries have a little bit more uh, social skills than Estonians, let's say like this. So uh, I have learned a lot from uh, from our Egyptian chef, how, because she was a teacher in, uh, in, in her previous life, let's say. Uh, so she had really skills, how to manage people, how to manage, you know, basically customers in, in a very much more sensitive way than I knew. So this obviously gave us a competitive advantage as a company. So, you know, there is a lot of benefits also in recruiting refugees that, you know, yes, you as a company, you help out refugees, you help out the country, you help the integration process, and that's good. But you really help out your company as well. Uh, and, uh, and this, you know, perhaps can be used also for some board members who are less interested about helping out integration processes, but more interested in, you know, finding a competitive advantage as a business. Yep, but I think uh, I covered all stuff. So I had, don't know how fast it went, but uh, if you have questions, I will answer. It was inspiring. Thank you very much, Dan. And of course, now we will have to be ready for an incredible amount of questions. After <laughs> this presentation. But please, Try to be as brief as possible because, uh, uh, yeah, the time is it's, it's, it's a bit limited. So the first question is coming from Maria. Uh, what sources of finances? Uh, what what finances? What sources finance your project? Basically, do you have you know only like self sustainable approach, or do you have some external funding? The other question, which is really relevant, is could you please share some numbers? For example, how many refugees and migrants work for you, you know, and how many, for example, started working in other companies after, you know, uh, the, let's say, a kick off in, in your companies, yeah, you know, yeah, so, yeah. so that's, that would be another question. And of course, the third question is about, you know, approaching those black uh, customers. So how you do that? Do you have any lessons learned sessions with the other employees or with their senior management or you know how you do it how do you interrupt is it on the spot is it afterwards you know with the bad apple customers yes yes okay yeah, yeah. okay uh, so these are the three questions and if you will manage the last question a bit more details on the language training done if you if it, if it would be possible because this is really 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 crucial element because if you are onboarding illiterate people or people that really limited Education experiences. This is very important for the Baltic countries as well. Thanks a lot. So we have four yeah, questions. Try to do it quickly. <laughs> yeah. So for fun you. yeah, for funding, we don't have like a yearly based stable funding. We just uh, tried, you know, one part is self sufficiency, which has been hard because restaurants and COVID time. So you know, 
but uh, we do have some uh, some funders who you know there's application round for you know i don't know uh projects then we write in our government project there and if we we're lucky we get money so we have a, we have had two bigger funding opportunities like this and one of them is still uh, you know financing us uh, and we are using uh, this money to develop you know to kickstart our estonian language program and this kind of stuff but the funding is more as a kickstart and then you know long term it's it's our own stuff uh, uh, so numbers we are really really tiny still uh, so right now for example we have uh, four people from uh, refugee or migrant backgrounds uh, at the current station and uh, although you know there is a much greater need but just because we are a company we're a company still and you know if we don't it's a corona time that people don't order catering you know we are we are our development program is not lectures it's based on work you know and if there isn't enough catering orders for example we can't really engage refugees we can't offer that practical training stuff uh, and also i think but uh, we you know during the last two three years uh we have had maybe 12 15 people come through uh, and i guess half of them have gone forward to new jobs uh, but you know since we don't have huge resources to really do impact measurement you know i don't know exactly was it german that you know inspired and helped or or maybe you know maybe he or she could have done it anyway you know so I don't want to take too much credit for that because I don't know exactly. I can guess, I can assume, but you know, it's not very scientific. Uh, bad Apple customers. That was the third question. We it depends, like because uh, I or somebody like me is not always on the spot there. You know, sometimes there is like two refugees working in a takeaway cafe, and this happens, right? So you know, then uh, we we haven't done any. Again, we don't have funding. We don't have stuff to do it really uh because we are a really tiny company so we don't have like on the spot training or this kind of stuff and we don't react really on the spot unless i or somebody like me is there but most of it is just uh later we have every we have weekly meetings with the whole team for example and then we talk through you know what happened how was it da, 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 da. and the main stuff is then you know to acknowledge that it happened the first thing I will not saying it's bad apple. It, it doesn't happen that much because that then I'm then I'm like uh, defeating the purpose. Then I'm saying to the refugee, your care, your worry doesn't matter. You know. So first of all, I acknowledge. Yes, it happened. How did it make you feel? What happened exactly? You know. Yes, it happened. I'm not trying to be like, oh, it's just uh, you know, it doesn't happen so much. I'm not saying that. Yes, it happened. Okay. I ask about the feelings. Da 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 da, da and I try to you know, then express that we care. You know. And if you need any help and you're good and we care and da, 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 da. so i'm trying to give this you know if a racist comes and oh you suck you know then i'm giving giving the balance okay you are awesome actually and that's all what we, that we do basically and for most part it's all that is enough you know for a minimum level of course you know we could do trainings we could do different things but we're a small company and most you know not all come there are other some small companies you know cafes who don't have resources huge resources to do these trainings but this doesn't mean that you shouldn't take on refugees just being a caring person and doing this kind of stuff already helps a lot there. and the third question was this language training stuff so we have kind of a three or even four tire system that when a person comes uh, to to german first uh, she he works just basic skills i don't know stuffing falafel cutting onions this kind of uh, kitchen work uh, and uh, we we try to teach you know we have i don't know posters with language with uh, notes you know with language skills uh, like okay onion is uh, puzzle or whatever in arabic for example uh, so first is you know we do it there we teach the language then next level is she will uh, participate in uh, festivals where there is a little bit of customer interaction you know a little bit more talking uh, and we support her there and then number three, she starts working at our takeaway when there is a lot more customer interaction and more like dynamic questions. And number four, the progress level is she starts doing a workshop, you know, when there is a lot of different interactions and not just about food, about her, her stories and so forth. So that's kind of the levels. And we have uh, volunteer language buddies who, uh, who meet with refugees every week and who can be like, okay, next, last week, 
in your workplace what did you talk what were the things what help do you need and uh let's prepare for next week uh, basically and also you know we we partner with the uh, unemployment office there is some general language classes that we can refer the people to uh but uh but the main key is just learning through practice having these language buddies and really because that gives the motivation you know that you are at work you know you need the language if you don't have work why should i why should i learn the language you know if i'm hopeless i don't find work in any in any way like okay fine if I, even if i go to the language class i will just forget it because i don't use it then. but since they are unemployed they are unemployed that, that means you know the motivation is much higher as well anyway that was quick <laughs> as i could thank you very much by the way dan do you know that are there any similar companies in lithuania and latvia working for the same concept or not yet uh, i don't think I, I'm not sure. I know in uh, Latvia there was one uh, one cafe like this, but I don't think they're active anymore. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. But if you if anybody knows, let us know. And yeah, also, perfect. if you want to ask any more questions, have ideas for cooperation, yeah. you can just email me, and uh, yeah, we can do it. And also, I just recall then that uh, I think we had also very interesting cooperation that we uh, linked you with the Norwegian social enterprise that also most probably help you both of your parts to develop some some skills so we are yeah as always we we say please feel free to reach out to us because we have regional context and might might be that you know we can we can uh, exactly. also be uh, helpful they, they will uh, visit us soon in estonia by the way uh, our norwegian partner so that's uh, really helps us also so we are very happy dan could you please unshare your screen if you can e Yep. Yeah, and, and now we will move to Lithuania for the sake of diversity. We will have no presentation, but uh, rather we will have a very simple and informal chat together with uh, with Mindogas, uh, who is a representative of Freor. And I have to say that um, I'm really, really happy, uh, Mindogas, to have you here, because uh, especially now in the Lithuanian context, there are only few companies which are really openly talking about about this topic and and I, I I'm really also happy because of the fact that you know we have been emphasizing quite a lot today the partnerships between the private sector and the NGOs and as far as I know that uh, uh, you are not a new company in this area you have been working for some time by employing refugees and also you are cooperating with the, some selected NGOs or, or, or one NGO. So maybe just for the very beginning, could you please describe a bit of how you started, when you started, you know, to, to at least consider to reach out to refugees and, and, and how we managed to reach to the refugees and how the NGO sector helped you actually to, to do that. Over to you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, so... Uh... We started uh, probably three, four years ago, uh, and uh, that start was accidental. Uh, the Red Cross, they somehow found us and uh, proposed uh, people, uh, refugees, uh, to be employed at our company. Um, in Lithuania, it's a little bit, maybe I think it's a little bit different than in Finland or Estonia, uh, because we have a lot of uh, people working who are uh, well, they're Lithuanian, but they speak, uh, a lot of them speak Russian, a lot of them speak Polish, uh, and in our company, for our company is more than 20 years old, um, and we are a manufacturing company, we are producing uh, refrigeration equipment for stores and so on, um, and uh, since all, already all the time there were a lot of people working from other countries, we have working people from the same, from Belarusia, uh, there are some people working from uh, even from Latvia, from Russia. We had some uh, people working from Armenia, uh, even had some from Venezuela and so on. So when the Red Cross came came up to came up to me and proposed uh, for the refugees to start, we I said okay, let's try it. And um, practically we had one guy that came up to us. He couldn't speak any Lithuanian, any English, uh, any Russian, nothing. Uh, but we tried it. Um, the try was really like um, simple. We just put him to some simple tasks uh, at assembly of the of those refrigerators. Uh, and uh, 
uh, he was working here there maybe for a year. Uh, then his son came also. Uh, he tried it. Then he left the, uh, our, that our, our work. Um, but at that time, in those year, he that guy started learning Lithuanian, uh, a little bit English from somewhere, and there was none. There was they were starting speaking with each other, and uh, at all maybe in these three years there probably have been about twenty refugees that were working in Frior. Uh, at this moment, I think uh, if my numbers are correct, uh, there are ten refugees working uh, in Frior. Um, Eight of them are from this year. Uh, what the situation was is of the COVID again, um, everything was stopped. And then at the beginning of the year, um, the economics, they exploded. Everyone wanted to build uh, constructions and so on and so on. And we had this problem that um, uh, we're also getting a lot of new orders and we needed more people to, to work, uh, more workers. And that was the problem because uh, we of the COVID, there was no people coming from the same Belarus, from Ukraine, that they working on the construction sites. And uh, and uh, even from our company, a lot of young guys, they just went for the summertime, like for summer job to work at the constructions. The work is harder, but they're paying, let's say, better salaries and so on. So this was even by the days that I see that we, 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 we had these refugees come to us, they were on May, on uh, January, and summertime. And they still are working. And now it's much, much easier for us um, to work with refugees because there are uh, like um, that old, old worker that he knows already, he speaks in Lithuanian. And now even if they come, come to us uh, from Red Cross with these new refugees, uh, we walk, we make walk around, show them what, what will be the work. And they practically know each other. They already know that person in their community. So it's really quite easy to do that. Uh, they start again the simple work, simple jobs and uh, some of them, yeah, there are some, 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 uh, some of the refugees that speak quite good Lithuanian already. Uh, they speak English. So, uh, but practically most of the, our workers, they don't speak English. Uh, so uh, they speak more like Russian. Uh, so the language isn't a biggest problem uh, at the moment. And uh, for other companies that to start uh, employing the refugees, uh, the best thing it is to, to just to start it. When you start it and you have, uh, uh, you have this one or two people, persons who already know how, how to work, they, they know the language, they can communicate with you, they can teach other, other, other refugees, other colleagues that will work with them. So that's, that's the thing. And they, sometimes they, they even ask uh, from Red Cross, are you not worried that they don't speak uh, language? No, it's, it's not a problem. Already it's not a problem because as we have 10 people, uh, about four of them are speaking Lithuanian. Uh, it's not a problem. They already speak with each other. Of course, they're working together. Uh, it's much simpler. They learn from each other. So that, that's the way we've done. And really, they have uh, even even with them is uh, even better to work because they they all have higher motivation than uh, let's say native worker because they value that job because it's not that simple to get that job, uh, especially in Lithuania, as I understand. Uh, and um, so maybe that's for, for introduction. Okay, thank you very much. That was all of the presentation of the <laughs> of your story thanks a lot Mindogas. Uh, and i think this is really interesting that that uh, that i mean you know you have this uh, really um you know comprehensive cooperation with the red cross and i think this this brings much more value to both refugees and and, and for the company may i ask a very practical question i mean you have been engaged for yeah, almost four years 20 refugees came through we have now 10 refugees employed you have also quite a diverse workforce, as I understood, like from many countries, which means that most probably you don't have uh, any problems, you know, with the attitudes coming from other employees towards refugees, or you still have a, you know, a certain stereotypes. Because we have heard many examples that, you know, as soon as refugee onboards the company, 
the other employees, even other countries, like in the Western countries, they are showing a bit of the resistance. Have you ever experienced that? And if yes, how you address that? Uh, I should say that, yes, there was some kind of a resistance, but um, uh, as I said, uh, a lot of uh, our, in our company working people, they are also from, well, then even don't speak home at Lithuanian. They speak maybe a little bit Polish, maybe a Russian and so on. So, but that was practically with that first, first, uh, first uh, employee. Uh, now they, the per, well, at our at our factory, they are working a lot of people. We have now practically 400 people working, uh, and we had like five more than 50 people coming uh, this year. So from 50 people, 20 percent was refugees that we took this year. So it's quite a significant significant number. Uh, and uh, how we reacted? Well, I should give all the credit to that guy that worked. He somehow didn't react anything and the time just showed uh, and people they I don't know I think because our our, our mentality is like uh, a lot of uh, our uh, our workers as I said they're not speaking only like I don't know like it would be only Lithuanians and that's it and you we don't accept anything they also as, as I mentioned a lot of were speaking Polish uh, Russian and and I think that went through. Okay, uh, very practical question again, Milugas. Uh, let's say, you know, we have been engaged with this, uh, let's say, element for more than four years. And uh, what what you would suggest, what would be your tips for the companies that they have never done this? As yeah, you said, like from the beginning, should they do this on their own? Should they reach out to the NGOs? how they should prepare the management, how they should prepare the workplace, etc. Any tips for the companies that have never done that? Uh, the first tip is just try to do it. Uh, because um, I think the same problem is everywhere now, uh, that uh, the lack of uh, working force. In Lithuania, it's a big, big problem of lack of uh, working force. And... Um, this is one of the one of the ways to get that working force because there are a lot of refugees. They they actually willing to work. They want to work, uh, and uh, you just need to have uh, to give them a chance. When you give a chance, as I said, our practice is like from one person uh, who was uh, who 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 stayed, who knew everything, who learned the language, and now it's much much easier to 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 get new 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 people working, and they are all. Which is also very different from 21 to maybe 55, something like that. That I work. Mm -hmm. So, would you would you recommend to go on their own? Would you recommend to contact the Red Cross and other NGOs? What you, would you say the best way to let's say to onboard to, to start the process? Because as far as I understood, as soon as you have three or five refugees, then you have the access to whole the community. But how to do uh, at the very beginning? I think it would be probably through the Red Cross, because again, at first when they were asking, they, what do you need? I said, maybe we need some specialities like electricians and so on, but really it's very hard and uh, you can get that. That, that. that workforce will really be at first uh, not, um, not a lot of, uh, how to say, it won't be very, very, that word, forgot. Uh, that workforce, it will be simple. They won't mm -hmm. do some, some super tasks it will be simple jobs but again they willing to learn and they are learning and they are really doing doing much complicated work than they were doing uh, at the beginning mm -hmm. when here. and the last question now comes from maria to you in the way uh would you appreciate or would you like let's say that ngos would prepare the migrants and the refugees like you know this uh, career training before they come to your company. Would you see the logic behind that? Somebody would prepare for your company that somebody would come and, you know, do the specific job, maybe more qualified, better paid, etc. Yeah. Uh, well, the thing is that uh, our company is the only company in the whole Baltic states. There are no other factors oh. like this. So to prepare for that special thing, I don't think that it's even really possible so uh, 
of course, if, if they had some kind of a basic, I don't know, training, maybe language learning and so on, uh, of course, everything is, is helpful. Everything is helpful. Super. Thank you very much once again, Mindogas, for, for, for being with us. I mean, your experience is amazing. And, and let's keep in touch for a further cooperation. And now I'm going My to uh, to uh, last speaker, but not least. It's uh, uh, Inessa, HR project manager at the Swedbank Latvia. Really, really, really happy, Inessa, to have you here. I remember that I think our, our first contact was again not the direct one, but through the NGO, which is I want to help refugees. Yeah. And I also remember that we did very interesting uh, training on the refugee inclusion and intercultural competences at at, uh, at Swedbank in, in Riga. Uh, so over to you uh, with the very interesting, small but ambitious uh, initiative. Yes. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm honored today to share our so story. It's just one case story in, case, in fact, but I hope it will inspire somebody to start work on this topic. And uh, yes, so um, maybe you would ask how our bank came to this point, but I won't tell all our ambitions. But one of the things we are talking and work and we work very strongly is diversification of our talents and teams already who is working and those who are looking on. And we are looking on any pool of candidates who could be the best for our company and refugee could be one of it because as previous speakers already mentioned, there is people who are ready for this market. But let's look on our case and our approach. First of all, what I want to say, it's we see what's very important, there is commitment from those who are involved. So we were very happy with our CEO, Rainis, had personal attitude, he has personal interest he was involved in the process and so everything else was much easier to do and everybody else was also much more interested and uh, motivated because we see that it comes from our main board team member and also others supporting it. Uh, this is a short view on our colleague and situation and why it was only one person in fact it was a man it is a man and uh, he has a very basic knowledge of English, no Latvian at all. And as Carol is mentioned in Latvia, it's also a rather strong uh, need to have a Latvian to have a different kind of job and to feel comfortable. But uh, he has a uh, high education and worked in the education area previously. Uh, before Swedbank, he worked service area and we saw already in our first meetings that he was keen on learning things and languages and his main motivation was his family. And yes, we met him uh, through organizations that want to help refugees uh, who also help us with the mentor and we'll tell about it a little bit later. And so it was the way how we find that uh, we can help somebody and he will help us to learn and to make more rich our team. And we started by step by step, and this could be like a list what to do first. First, in the beginning, it's uh, important to define why you are doing it and what you want to achieve. So is it to help? Is it to recruit, to help learn language, or is it a combination? For us, it was a combination of all aspects and many others also. Then we thought who will be involved in the project. And for us, I saw as a, we are a rather big company in Latvia, we have 2000 people. Now, and I met each person personally who was involved in the beginning of a project. And we talked through, I answered all of the questions. And even if there were some we, we didn't know how to answer, we decided, yes, we don't know. I can't answer to mom. Let's find the way how we can do it or who will support us and list all the doubts or things you don't know just to learn about them lately, but not to forget of. What we did, we make like a project team, I would say maybe somebody didn't know what he's a part of a project team, what it was. Uh, so first, uh, first of all, it was our team who, uh, where, where we, this new colleague uh, joined us, it was HR and was internal mentor from the same team our colleagues cooperate with. And we also prepare it administration support because of course as um, a big company, we have inter internal procedures and they had to be adapted uh, to suit this situation. 
Uh, we raised the awareness, we learned what our colleagues in Sweden have done in similar project. Uh, we used Carolis uh, for external training and information. We refreshed our internal trainings, which we had uh, on a regular basis. And also with Carolis, and I want to I want to help refugees organizations, we got a lot of additional information, how our companies are dealing with it, what is important to think of. And we just went through all this information to rise our internal like it's not only awareness but like be sure what you're doing of uh, good things and not doing something very wrong and what were our steps so we adjusted our pre-onboarding and onboarding processes we made a clear information and prepared it for this colleague uh, we made with milestones when we will have follow-ups uh, we decided that he will be involved in any processes and activities in the company. We have any other employees, even if he didn't understand in the beginning, but just to have a feeling that he's a part of the team anyway. We spoke only Latvian. In the beginning, yes, we had a mentor from I want to help refugees who help to translate many things. But uh, after some weeks, we began using only Latvian. So it was in the beginning, easy sentences, some synonyms, uh, hands, uh, pictures, many other things, how we tried uh, to communicate and became easier and easier. And we know that he will need additional time off to work to solve some different issues. So we understood that he will not be eight hours uh, sharp. So it was also a part of our work. Our greatest support was Carolis uh, with his colleagues uh, who had like an umbrella of mentoring us in fact, and uh, helping us to understand what is the situation, uh, what is important to take in account and many other things. But the greatest was this organization, I uh, want to help refugees who gave the mentor for translating things, who supported uh, him on a personal level. And so we had a possibility to cooperate and uh, have a lot of questions to rise and to solve. We also approached governmental organizations for different kinds of support for the colleague. Uh, the main part was taken uh, by on personal level and I can't uh, com like say how it went, it was it good or not, but uh, I mainly communicated through to understand if it's possible to get language uh, learnings and uh, those kind of support. And um, it is possible to get, uh, maybe it's not easy to find the information uh, uh, for the employer. But uh, we understood that it will take time for us and uh, it will be additional like documentation part. So we drop off and decided to do it on our own. But uh, we can send only the best uh, about the people whom we contacted. They were well helpful and very kind and ready to support us, in fact. And here is a short like view on uh, all the process uh, and what we added in each, what is like for a normal employee, if I can say normal, and what we added for this colleague. So it was additional uh, like um, uh, agreement on collaboration way. It was about the arrangement, how will he will finish at um, existing cooperation with um, his previous uh, employer, that it's inclusive to him and also that we respect this company. It was additional uh, aspects of uh, and conversations between us about cultural and social aspects. Of course, it's well, well through the work conditions. Uh, for example, we took a holidays, but we on the bank holidays have free days, so you will also have free day. But we also talked what is in his culture, what will be additional his needs to have free days and many such things which uh, could uh, for both of us to understand what is possible and what not and what is asked because we di really didn't know his um, uh, like, yes, we didn't know about his culture so much. Uh, as we in bank have a lot of work and as you know, in the main work um, connected to the computers, we had an additional like upskilling program for him. We went through the Excel, PowerPoints, Teams and other aspects because he haven't used it for some time. So we need to be sure that he will be comfortable and ready to use it on the necessary level. And when he started in, uh, his work activity, so we had an adaptation period when he uh, tried to understand how he works, how much time it asks from him to whom he can turn in different questions if they arise. 
And also it was an adaptation for us to understand who will support it, especially if the mentor is in not in office, if there are other kind of questions we can't um, answer at the moment. And what is important as I see through this situation? First of all, respect and ensure uh, an attitude as for any regular employee. I would say it's like some kind of normalization. I think that Dan talked about it. We don't want to empathize that he's a refugee, he's a colleague, and he just needs a little bit more support than others to have possibility to feel like a normal personality. Uh, it's very important to explain everything in detail connected to rights, possibilities, benefits, because if it's normal for somebody who is living in Latvia, it's something new for those who are foreigners. And uh, those people who are refugees were even shy, I would say, to ask. They don't believe they deserve it. So you really have to talk about it. Of course, learning about this person's personal education skills and knowledge is something that helps you in your work and to adjust to a current situation. And most important is not to forget and remember that they have own heritage and experience and that just for conversations, just I think it's your work. It helps to understand how we think, how we see us, I would say, and how we can make it like in a normal uh, process and it has already becomes something very understandable. And lessons learned so far, because we already uh, we still continue our collaboration with this colleague and we'll do it uh, for the next year, definitely. And so the things that we learned like uh, to take in, into account. So first of all, you need flexibility in mindset. You need flexibility in adapting and uh, changing approaches you have already have in the organization. It's very difficult for such big ones as we are because we are four countries uh, with rather similar processes. So you have to adapt and find a way. You have to invest in time because this case, it's not only about any new employee who needs time from his manager, from his colleagues to feel comfortable and to fit in. But here you have to add its additional time and to be sure that uh, nothing is missed from your conversations. As I mentioned, yes, help to understand uh, everything, uh, explore on labor market opportunities to support you. And don't forget about personal support and personal attitude and touch in your communication because those colleagues possibly uh, doesn't know something you know. A very easy example, uh, last year when I know it will be snowing for the first time uh, very strongly and I knew that colleague haven't lived in Latvia in some snowy day, I just mentioned that next day it will be traffic jams because of the snow. So please take into consideration before coming. So just such things helps people to understand what, what it will uh, like make um, an influence on them. Learning language is very important. We had internally uh, decided that we will help him to find the teacher. And so he is learning externally, he is learning through his friends, but also internally we have and our additional attitude, like uh, conversations, we're helping to correct the mistakes. We are writing to each other emails each week just to learn how, is, how to use Latvian um, language in a written way. And so any other activities to just to speak about any case that it is possible to help him to learn and to adapt more in um, local society. And the last thing, not the least, there's always some will be something you don't know how to do, or what to do, what to think of. It's just a part of time and you have uh, to be open and simple and to be um, ready to do it, to be genuine from to the other side to yourself and everything will be possible. In fact, it sounds very easy, but in some cases you have to think that it's, it's doable because I really believe that together we make a difference. It's a slogan for the Swedbank, but in fact, it's for every one of us. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Ines. And I, 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 I really very much appreciate your approach also because, you know, uh, looking at the very beginning, uh, it's, it's really clear that you have a strategy and actually you, you even created the action plan for uh, one case, which is, which is really great. And maybe that's why also we have uh, as much questions as all the other participants, even I don't have the time to uh, ask my questions. Uh, so the first part would be, uh, 
after these experiences of one person, would you say that you are now ready to hire more refugees? And most probably this question is very much related to Ronald's uh, message <laughs> to you that, uh, that uh, he may have a potential candidate uh, with experiences in financial sector and good English language skills, as well as uh, he speaks a, a bit of Latin on the level A2. So most probably I will, of course, leave this for you to discuss bilaterally, but this is also a very good opportunity. So that's the first question. Uh, the second question uh, also would be about onboarding process. Uh, so uh, the first thing, how long has this person worked for you? And how long was the onboarding process? And uh, the focus is basically on the length of the onboarding process, whether this was longer than for a, a, a regular procedure or it was shorter or what was really uh, uh, different. So uh, that's two questions and I will come with the third one. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So about other refugees, I would say what we have uh, CVs time to time from refugees and if it speak English and they apply for the positions which already don't need like a lot of Latvia and we have there is no problem to enter the company because we're especially if it's related to some positions which are international or teams are international there is uh, really no problem to speak only English and Latvian maybe you need on the basic um, level if we talk about such kind of uh, more additional situation uh, I'm not sure but I can say yes we are very open at the moment because uh, uh, it asks a lot of time uh, to for the mentor. It uh, needs like half of the time at the moment, and uh, it, so it 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 comes from this perspective. If we can find a person, then yes, and uh, if not, then it's rather difficult at the moment. Uh, and uh, the NGO support would be very helpful because without I want to, uh, to help refugees, I don't think it will be possible because uh, in such case it was very, very necessary to have understanding of the case. So, but it's not not to know, but just a very careful saying that we would need to look on the situation. But at the moment, like now, I, it's not very um, like possible just now. If we're talking about onboarding, I would say it was much long, longer because in the beginning we have to go through the social cultural aspects a lot uh, from the, how we smile. Do we talk to the manager? So you can imagine uh, many additional things we have to learn, to learn and to go through in addition to learn Excel, PowerPoint and all these aspects. So I would say uh, like more or less normal uh, period was much longer. It doesn't mean that it was written in the documents. The documents was like for any normal employee in Latvia and we did not change anything, but uh, the ambition to understand that the colleague feels good, it took much longer because he's very aware and sure. They are very shy and it asks a lot of additional time to make sure that no, you are a normal employee. If you want, you can go. It's not stricted uh, that you were um, or like laws or which you can use for any employee. Yes, you can go, you are a colleague. So yes, it's additional time. I would say half a year, definitely. But in some cases, I would say uh, we now together work for almost two full years and there are still some questions he all approaches and asks if I can. And I have to explain, yes, you can. It, nothing has changed, you are a colleague. So it depends maybe on the difficulty of the question, but yes, the adaptation period definitely it's difficult, but it's different, I would say. Yeah, thanks a lot. And the last question before we go into the open floor for the last 10 minutes, is about again, the language training at the workplace. Uh, Maria is asking, is the language um, learning process part of the working time? Because in her experience, working with migrants and refugees, uh, you know, they often, don't have time and energy to follow language courses after work. Yes, it was part of a work week. It was like both arrangements were made in the beginning when we met in the pre-onboarding period. So uh, he has his personal trainings outside the hours, 
and uh, he feels comfortable that uh, his trainings are in the end of the day. So we even in the beginning, in the first year, we decided that some days he will be working remotely, where are some things he can do remotely, and also it uh, the learning of language is part of his work because it will help him to um, adapt much faster than if it will be some kind of his own responsibility when he will do it. Thanks a lot, Inessa. Thanks a lot. It's really, really very much appreciated. Uh, okay, colleagues, then move to the last part. Uh, now we are um, actually announcing the open floor for the last 10 minutes. So if you have comments or questions, you can feel free to raise your hand and I will be able to see it. And meanwhile, I will just ask to, uh, uh, to share some thoughts and takeaways of our charter coordinators from all the three countries, how do they see the future of, of this topic together with the maybe members or, uh, or potential members? Uh, so maybe I will start with Lina, again, from the alphabetical order, because I know that Lina did some of the interesting focus group discussions with the employers, and maybe Lina have some takeaways to share with us. Over to you. Yeah, thank you. Um, so many points actually were reflected here and um, echoed uh, that uh, are similar to uh, the experience of Estonian employers. Um, um, I mean, others than Dan, <laughs> who I also spoke with. Um, actually, we didn't manage to do the focus groups because uh, I think it's still a little bit um, I did personal interviews uh, because I think it's still a little bit um, a topic where people want to kind of speak uh, just one-on-one, -on -one maybe. Uh, it's a little bit delicate in, in some uh, areas, I think. Um, and uh, I would say that this uh, experience of uh, Freor, uh, where, where you have one person coming to the company and then it kind of opens the door to many more. Uh, this is something that I saw also in, uh, in the Estonian company's experience. So maybe it's something also that we could kind of think about if, if this is, um, this is um, an entry point or, or some kind of good example experience that we can take from here, maybe if we want to kind of um, mm. create more refugee inclusion uh, to give employers these kind of experiences uh, with, with one person or with a few people at first and then maybe they can see that uh, it works and uh, and they can they can get this access as you mentioned to the community uh, as well so it's it's like uh, twofold you get the exactly. experience and then you also get access and you get the trust of uh, of this um, people thanks a lot in the over to you um so I'm uh, I, once again I'm very I'm very glad that one of our signatories is actually sharing uh, sharing the best practices and what I was saying while while the cameras were uh, while not everyone was uh, was in the room already it's like especially for a Latvian signatories a lot uh, a lot of them were asking some of the practical information, what they can actually do and um, in all the different levels. And I believe uh, uh, that we need within the Latvian charter, we need a conversation about this as like, we're a masterclass or something. It's like uh, on on how how we can, we can do it because I think what, especially what uh, Ines, was, uh, Ines was saying, it's like, even Swedbank is is a large company. It's like it provides, and everybody else provides such a simple steps. What everybody can do. It's like, which is I always see. It's like you you know you are giant. It's like we we have nothing to say or like we cannot do the same the same way. But actually, what do we learn? Uh, what do we learn is like we can do it. And I and I I love to. Uh, I love the, one of the questions. I, I do have a person that is uh, that is qualified for this, and I, th I think we, we need uh, we need as well to change the mindset of a lot of the companies uh, as well in here. And I think the charter will do this 
that uh, that uh, asylum seekers and refugees are unqualified uh, workforce. It's like they are, some of them are very qualified workforce and we have to give an opportunity. So, so yeah, so I think we're gonna, we're going to, uh, we're going to continue, but uh, as well taking on the political perspective, this is going to be a very challenging, a uh, challenging issue for the coming month uh, due to the crisis that we have on the border. So, but um, but still, it doesn't mean we do not have already uh, an asylum seekers and refugees that are looking for uh, a perfect job uh, already on the on on the spot. So, yes, thank you, Catalyst, as well, and thank you, Lena, for organizing this everything, and thank you for all the speakers uh, who have been speaking. Thanks a lot. So uh, over to you, Rugile. Uh, and then I think I will finalize with my suggestion how we can also uh, go towards uh, another specific topic, which is a huge challenge. Rugile. Yes, uh, thank you everyone uh, for sharing uh, the experience that you had. For me, I don't know what's the word, maybe it was healthy uh, to hear and understand that everyone is at least slightly afraid. So refugees and migrants, they're afraid to start uh, approaching companies and they do not know how to do that. Employers sometimes are also afraid. They do not know how to approach cultural differences, the harassment that might uh, uh, happen in the workplace. Uh, so it comes both ways. And uh, hearing Dan uh, uh, saying that sometimes he doesn't know how to, uh, what to do or how to say, and uh, it comes organically and naturally. And hearing Mindogas uh, taking a simple approach and just uh, sharing uh, the value and the power of one uh, employer uh, that's been working so for so long and he's been so uh, important in, in creating the environment and welcoming uh, everyone else. So having those uh, examples from today um, and hearing what you said, I have a few steps uh, in my mind. Uh, so as a uh, charter, uh, next year in uh, January or February, uh, we'll do trainings on uh, cultural diversities for international uh, um, uh, staff and working environment. So those of you who think that you do not have enough resources and uh, you're a small company and uh, you just, uh, yeah, you, you do not organize them yourselves, you'll have this opportunity to come and join us. And in fact, everyone is welcome. Uh, I would be glad to share information uh, about this event uh, to you later. Uh, the second thing is that uh, what I hear today uh, is that not easy? It's not easy, and we rely on NGOs uh, to find uh, refugees and to find migrants. Sometimes migrants are also having um, struggles uh, how to find companies. Uh, so uh, we will create a, a mobile um, IT platform uh, to connect uh, refugees and migrants with uh, companies. Uh, so we'll be glad to, uh, to share information about this uh, in the coming here. Uh, but uh, yeah, for now, once again, thank you for what you shared. And I'm very glad that we'll continue working on this uh, topic in 2022. Thanks a lot, Rogila. And just for the, yeah, unfortunately, we don't have more time. But what I really would like also <clears throat> to explore in the future together with all of you is the concept of intersectionality. Because we haven't touched upon this, because we all know from the OECD reports, it comes from our UNHCR snapshot with the refugees that yes, employment is a challenge. But employment for refugee women, it's a much bigger challenge because of the many issues. Gender-based violence, honor-based violence, cultural dimensions, and of course the very specific labor market needs that, for example, maybe in the Freor or in other companies, you know, potentially you might be able to employ more refugee men than refugee women. So I think this is on the pipeline. I really know that done. And of course, uh, Ula and Johanna and Ika from Finnish Refugee Council and from IKEA Finland, they have they have this knowledge because they they have the employment and the, and the procedure even for refugees and migrants, which is also focusing on the diversity. But unfortunately, we have just one one minute left, uh, so I think uh, we will not be able to touch this. But we really do hope in the future that we will we will be able to work on on also more vulnerable refugee groups as 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 refugee women. And I think this is where we will also be 
uh, you know, uh, glad again to further exchange with uh, uh, Finnish partners on the very specific issues, you know, not, not on the generic employment procedures, but, you know, on the gender dimension uh, uh, and, uh, and et cetera. And I think then later, maybe I see Ronalds have questions to IKEA, so, uh, but unfortunately we have just one minute. So what we will be able to do is colleagues, uh, you have our contacts, you have contacts of all the diversity charters, uh, we really have rich experience coming from the Finnish Refugee Council, needless to say that we have here Caritas and Red Cross from Lithuania on board, so we will be definitely able um, and happy to connect to, to, uh, to all of us and all of you, because this is, again, uh, as also Dan said, this is not just, you know, about having a strategic plan behind, it's also about just going there and, and do the things, and if you need something, just call us. And uh, yeah, let's make uh, the life of refugees better at the end of the day. So thank you once again very much for all, all the speakers. It was really, really amazing. I had uh, 25 questions that I've never been able to ask one because of very active audience, but it shows that all experiences are really, really relevant and, and really practical. So I'm very happy and uh, let's keep in touch and have a good upcoming weekend to all of you. Bye bye and take care. Thank you, bye. Thank you very much, Carolis and Lina and everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Bye. bye.